Good morning. I'm waiting for John here. Are we starting? Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Um, so um, we go from the heavily empirical to the uh, totally anecdotal. Um, <laughs> I uh, I asked for uh, some time to talk a little bit because um, of the work, international work I'm doing. Uh, there's there are some issues about evidence use that I'm I'm observing, um, and so this this conversation is based more on personal observations, and one might think of it as more a pre-research discussion because I think there are, there's some there's important work to be to be done here, but. Uh, this, this, what I'm going to say today rests just on his uh, experience-based uh, experience, evidence from experience, uh, not uh, certainly not from any research. My uh, since 2005, I've been doing a considerable amount of international work. CPRI at TC now has projects, uh, fairly large projects in five countries, um, and we're negotiating work in three more countries uh, at, at right at the moment. And of course, Teachers College has projects, uh, large projects in, in additional places. And I'm now the Associate Vice President for International Affairs, so I also get involved in some of those other projects. But um, this, my comments are gonna go very, grow very heavily out of CIPRI's experience in Jordan, Palestine, Thailand, Mexico, Poland, which are places where we now have, uh, we have active uh, projects. So just the, the general observations. There's a, internationally, there's an increased amount of investment and evaluation. Up until a few years ago, for example, the World Bank uh, did very little uh, evaluation work. Now it's made the decision that, that, that projects ought to be evaluated and, and created a, an initiative uh, to, to do that. Uh, USAID had cut way back on spending on evaluation during the 90s and uh, the, fir the first decade, um, and has now uh, decided that it, it needs evaluation data and has ramped up uh, investments in evaluation. There are some new mechanisms that have been created for sharing knowledge that comes out of uh, international evaluations. There's a, something that probably most of you know about, there's an international initiative for impact evaluation that uh, for example, if you go on their website, you're going to find you're going to find the results of almost uh, almost 600 RCTs that have been conducted just in the last five years. Um, and uh, the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation, the th the three three IE uh, initiative, um, actually funds uh, evaluation work and has funding from Gates, but also from most of the major national. Uh, aid organizations, uh, USAID, uh, Canada, Denmark, Germany, whatever, all, all fun. Yeah. I'm sorry, what? Is that the Campbell? No, no, no. This is not Campbell. This is a totally independent uh, initiative. Um, and not, as far as I can tell, not connected to Campbell either, uh, which is interesting. Um, but Campbell would be another, would be another example. Um, there's, a, there's also increased investment um, by the bank and, and by USAID and by the, the 3IE in knowledge synthesis, beginning to produce uh, uh, you know, documents that try to, to pool information across studies. And of course, there's an increased use of benchmarking, which, which is, a, I think, a much more problematic um, kind of activity, which I would, I'll come back to uh, as well. At the same time, uh, in the countries in which we're working, I observe very little change in ministry behavior. Um, ministries uh, are, are still mostly focused on what I would think of as fads, not to say that they're not, that they're not useful, but they adopt, they're adopting them because of, uh, of the faddishness of them, not because of any evidence. So there's a big interest in the use of tablets, um, a lot of interest in inquiry or in, in, pro in project learning, um, and a lot of interest in decentralization. And most of the decentralization work is not being motivated because of research that shows that it engages the community or provides more support for children, but being done purely and simply to pass on financial responsibility from central governments to local governments, 
without any understand without any understanding of the inequities that they are walking themselves into. Um, they are recreating uh, in many countries uh, our state system of finance with all of its uh, with all of its problems. But so you don't see I don't see the, the ministries uh, in the ministries you see a very heavy reliance on trusted expatriate gurus and not not particularly on evidence of any or any sources of evidence but but individuals who who people have connected with often in their graduate education in the UK or the United States um, and these relationships are much more important than the person's uh, academic status in, in the home country uh, or their particular or their expertise evidence of their expertise um, so I just give you one example of this that uh, there, I'm doing. We have a big project in, in Thailand in science and mathematics. Um, there's a parallel project in Thailand run, run by the ministry that's being totally shaped by an assistant professor from Cortland State, who happened to do graduate work with the woman who now is the head of of the Office of Basic Education, and so you know, and, and that that kind of relationship is pr pr pretty common in a, in Southeast Asia. But it, and uh, and also in Jordan and Palestine, so it, you know I, th I think that's not not so unusual. Research offices exist in the ministries, but they usually have they have very low low in much in, they don't have much influence. They're usually way down on the food chain and, and don't are not part of, um, of policy discussions. So I'm gonna uh, I, I'm gonna focus my comments here mostly on USAID this morning, not. Singling, singling them out actually more out of, out of self-interest than out of it, the, the fact that there's, they're any different than anyone else. The self-interest is, is that teachers' college is in the moment uh, actively uh, engaged in, in uh, pursuing some contracts with USAID. So understanding their culture and how they work has be, uh, been a preoccupation of mine for the last uh, six months. So, there's, so these, there's, they're an organization that I, at this point I know a little more about and, and this, therefore we'll make a few comments about. USAID has set three goals for education, three strategic goals to focus on between now and 2015. Goal one is to improve the reading skills of 100 million children by 2015. And, and counting up to 100 million is very important to them. They're much more, at this point, very preoccupied with that number, of you know, getting to that number. Goal two is improving the capacity of tertiary and workforce development programs. And goal three is increasing equitable access to education in conflict and crisis environments. And again, with a specific target of 15 million learners. Uh, here we're talking about you know, Afghanistan, Kosovo, Rwanda, uh, you know, places which have had uh, internal political conflict and crisis, southern Sudan, that, places of that type. I'm going to focus the comments on goal one because that's where, where we at TC have been focused and, and because I think there's some interesting issues that come out of that. So um, about, uh, about six years ago, um, with supporting actually from the Hewlett Foundation, Mike was there, with support from Hewlett and, uh, and others, uh, RTI, which is uh, the Research Triangle Institute, which is a major contractor with USAID. It's probably the biggest uh, contractor in education for USAID. Uh, pulled together people to develop a, uh, an assessment for reading. And the motivation for this was because uh, of evidence that existed that while during the 90s, 80s, 90s, and first part of this, of this uh, century, there had been a big increase in access to primary education in developing countries. There was evidence that, in fact, uh, the, that, the, that, that increase in access had not uh, done much to increase the quality of, of outcomes. In fact, there was a lot of evidence that by the end of third grade, large numbers of kids, uh, Liberia, for example, uh, a, a study done there showed that 40% of the kids could not identify a single word at the end of third grade. So you had a lot of kids who were engaged in seat time in schools, but there wasn't much, uh, much going on. So there was a lot of interest in trying to develop some way of assessing quality. Now, ironically, what's happened 
especially in Africa, is that the push, the World's Bank and UN's push for access has actually un undermined quality. So in Malawi, for example, which used to have a school system that was, um, in which there were, might be 25 to 30 kids to a class, now the average class size in Malawi is 80. Um, and in Mozambique, it's 70. And you know, I mean, so you've got, you, you, you've increased access, kids are going to school, but you're, you're, you haven't been able to increase the resources in, invested in education to, uh, to, uh, in a parallel way. So uh, <coughs> yesterday, Richard told me in the United States, we, the number of, number of teachers we have, number of staff we have, has been, it been growing at a rate two and a half times the rate of students. What's the, in the developing world, it's the opposite, exactly opposite of that. So we, we have, a, in Malawi, an average class size of, of almost 80. I'll come back to that in a minute. So a, a group of, of uh, psychometricians and reading experts and whatever were pulled together by RTI. And they looked at uh, a variety of asset, early assessments for reading. Um, and they developed a, a, a new early grade reading assessment, uh, lovingly known as EGRA. So you'll, if you're in the USAID community, EGRA is a very, very important idea. EGRA is basically an oral test administered, uh, it's based on dibbles. Um, it's administered um, individually, one student at a time. It takes, it takes about 15 minutes to administer. And in that 15 minutes, they claim to cover you know, seven or eight major skill sets of uh, elements of reading, uh, including, uh, I just listed some of them here, but concepts about print, phonemic awareness, oral vocabulary, listening comprehension, uh, and so on. We could go through that list, but there's a bunch of subtests in, in EGRA. But most of these subtests are based on uh, a, a single item or a, a couple of items that are part of the EGRA oral assessment. So the listing comprehension is a one minute part of EGRA. So just keep all that in mind. And these are being administered in most countries, um, most of the developing countries, um, by teachers who've had little or no training, uh, maybe typically primary teacher, typically education up to, up to 10th grade. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, 12 grade, 12 years of education, uh, but very little professional training. Um, and they're, they're administering this, the, these tests to students in a classroom environment in which there's 50, 60, 70 other students doing something while this is, while this is going on. Part of the genius of EGRA is that it's designed, um, and I don't have, I, didn't have the knowledge and the time to go into this in much detail, but it's designed to be a kind of a flexible frame that can be easily adapted to different languages. So it's actually been used now, up to now in 70 different languages. So EGRA allows you to assess reading in the mother tongue of the, the, if, if that's what the education is delivered in, but although in many cases the education is being delivered in a second or third language for the students. So again, in Malawi, um, instruct, a, lot of the, a lot of instruction is in English. Uh, when children are coming to school, maybe speaking, uh, you know, local, a local language, maybe also speaking Kiswahili. In Mozambique, uh, the education is in Portuguese, but, there, but people are, children speak 18 or 19 different other local languages. So, along with EGRA, USAID bought into and has embraced uh, a what, what's called the RTI model <coughs> based on the five T's. The teaching should be in the mother tongue, that you're going to improve teaching by teaching children, uh, teachers specific reading strategies, that there should be more time allocated to reading, uh, that, that children have to have text to read, which it's not like an obvious thing, but not, in some of these countries their text is, is not readily available. So that children spend more time with their eyes on text, and that tests should be used to provide guidance to the teacher about the progress that, that uh, students are making. So these five T's are are dominant. Now, what what's particular? This comes up because as well, we sit at Teachers College and think about bidding, bidding on um, USAID RFAs, 
The RFAs often come out and specifically prescribe what you must do, that you must use AGRA, you, you must do, you, you must provide professional development in a cascade model. You know, they're, 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 the RFAs tend to be very prescriptive and there's not much elbow room to say, well, that's okay, but in addition to that, we'd like to do, we think there should be a reading comprehension test or in addition to that, you know, we, we, in large classes, when we get 80 kids, we think thinking about personalized instruction doesn't make any sense at all. And we need to think about ways that the teacher can teach the entire, the whole class. Because, you know, if, if you're spending a lot of time on AGR, you're spending less time on instruction. And with 80 children, getting personalized information doesn't make too much sense. But, but the, at the moment, there's not a lot of elbow room to raise any of these other issues because this is an evidence-based model. And it's what USAID has embraced. But an equal concern here is that um, is that AGRA was designed for teacher diagnosis to provide to give the teacher some sense of being able to monitor kids' progress in reading. It would be, that's what Dibbles is used for, and it makes sense. But uh, it's now being it's now being used by USAID worldwide. To evaluate impact, so it's so we're now getting we're using AGRA, which is a, a personally administered oral test, in a pre and post fashion, to look at change over time, in reading in these classes that I've described. So we we now we're now collecting data AGRA data in a number of countries, and we, there have been countrywide studies so in Liberia, Gambia, Senegal. Uh, Malawi, and, uh, many other places, um, and in fact, in the, some of the recent RFAs that have come out um, from uh, USAID missions, they're requiring uh, R RCT, R RCTs to be done um, to show the impact of interventions using AGRA as the outcome measure. So, it's um, it's a, it's, it raises a lot of questions about, uh, you know, about the, the, a lot, there's a lot of questions about the quality of this data and a lot of questions about uh, the amount of time and energy that's going into collecting this evidence, uh, the messiness of the evidence. But, but in addition to that, um, the, 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 there's a real question in, in, among a lot of my colleagues at TC about whether or not uh, being able to identify 30 words in a minute constitutes reading. Um, there's, there's a real issue in all of this about what, what is reading? I mean, what, what do we mean that you can read? And a, basically, AGRA has a very, the kindest thing you can say is that there's a very soft measure of comprehension built into AGRA. It, it's, it largely rests on, relies on word recognition, so we know that kids know some words and that they can identify them relatively quickly. And the, the pace at which they can identify them, the speed, speed and accuracy of word recognition are central to these AGRA measures that are being used to um, count kind of reading. In addition to that, um, the World Bank has now decided to embrace value-added teacher evaluation. And in these same settings, the bank is pushing hard for countries to embrace teacher evaluation. And the only measure that they have is AGRA. So now, now AGRA is going to become part of teacher evaluation and that, that's, that's an active discussion in at least half the countries we're in and I'm sure in a bunch of, in a, in a bunch of others because the bank is pushing this idea fairly aggressively. Um, just a word about RCTs. So here's another interesting thing. There's a, the last five or six RFAs have been released by USAID. Um, and these, are, these RFAs are released by USAID missions, but they follow the guidelines set centrally by USAID generally. And the last five or six of them have required RCTs. But the RCTs are, are to be done in year one or two, and they last one year. And they're actually, and they, they're only to be one year in length, and they're occurring at the same time that you're beginning to implement the intervention. Right? And, and they're generally set up to compare the difference between a medium intervention and a more intensive intervention. 
and you know, trying to understand what is medium and what's intense is a, is a, is a, uh, it's a really, really interesting, it would, it would require throwing some chicken bones or something. It's you know, it's a very hard uh, thing, to, thing to figure out. But um, so, you know, so there's, a, there's some questions about the way in which RCTs are being used here, it seems to me, that are, and, and the way these tools are being, are being used. So that's, uh, those are some observations about USAID. I, I raise these partly maybe the, in hopes that colleagues have some ideas about, I think there are some, there's some research that, could, that should be done here on the way in which international donor organizations are using evidence, the way in which they are collecting evidence, um, the ways in which they, they are, they then shove uh, governments in, in low income countries into pursuing policies that may or may not make sense in that, um, in that context. So I think there's some interesting questions.